Congratulations, Jason. Uh, I, you know, I just was curious what, what your reaction to to all this is. You start the year, you get Tom Brady. Bruce is in his second season, and you're you're in your you know you're in the Super Bowl in your home stadium. I mean, just what? How has this year gone? What 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 can you say about it? Oh wow, it's been uh, well, it's been a lot of fun in a very challenging year with uh, everything that's going on in the world, the pandemic. So it's it's. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a kind of a strange feeling that hopefully we never have again. But, um, you know, I look back at this time last year compared to where we're at right now, and we still have unfinished business. Everybody is very focused on this game. I can assure you that. But just how far we came in a short amount of time um, in terms of our record and where we're at. And I, I just it's just a feeling of being grateful for – our ownership for giving us the resources that they had to keep this team together, to go out and get Tom, trade for Gronk, make some other moves uh, during the season um, when it would have been very easy for an owner to owners to pull the reins back a little bit, you know, for other, for reasons that go along with being in a pandemic, but still wanting us to push forward because they, they desperately want this. They want this. They wanted to be in the Super Bowl. They want to win it like we all did, but they want to do it for the fans. They love the excitement that the Tampa Bay fans have because of this. Um, that's, I think that's what drives them. And I'm just very grateful. We'll go to Jenna Lane. Hey, Jason, you spoke of ownership. In this business, uh, patience isn't always afforded to, to first-time GMs. You went through multiple coaches. You went through multiple quarterbacks. You went through multiple kickers. What has it meant for them to stick by you and allow you to fulfill the vision that you had uh, from when you first started here? You know, I'm very humbled. Um, and once again, I use the word grateful. Um, you know, like you said, I've been through a lot with my staff. They've done an incredible job. John and Mike and Mike and Rob and all the scouts. I could sit here for a long time naming everybody. I, I, I knew that I had a special staff. I knew that with BA, we had a, a rare coach. I said at the beginning of the year, we have a rare coaching staff. And just for it to finally come together the way it did this year so far, it's just uh, it's just a humbling experience. And I've matured in my position over the last three, four years. I was able to uh, learn from a lot of mistakes, and I had a lot. And I would always admit to those. And, you know, listening to my staff more, a more inclusiveness and more teamwork, I think has been the, the reason that it's, it's come together and we've made better decisions in the last few years. But then having a head coach like Bruce and the relationship that I have with him is, it, I don't know if it will ever be repeated. He's just such a unique guy and we have such a unique, strong bond that we, we get along well, we even argue well. And um, to get the result that we want and make the decisions that, we, that we've made. It's been awesome. We'll go to Greg Allman. Hey, Jason, I know you've had uh, a lot of coaches and GMs that you've worked under and learned from over the years. But I want to ask you about your time with Andy Reid in, in Philadelphia and what you remember most and, and how it helped you along the way. You know, I have just the utmost respect for Andy. I didn't work with him in the role that I'm in right now as the GM. Right. But I imagine that it would be very similar to the way the, my relationship is with Bruce. Just we had a great bond in my, as I was the – VP player personnel and the director of player personnel under him in, in Philly. Um, you know, I think what I've learned the most from observing him was leadership. He's a phenomenal leader and he was always quick to give credit to people and always quick to uh, take the bullet. And I really appreciated that about him. Um, he's just a great man and a great, obviously a very good, excellent uh, coach all of fame worthy coach. So um, just very appreciative. I reflect on my time with him often. We'll go to Scott Reynolds. Unfortunately for your, most of your tenure, you had a team that, that couldn't get out of its own way, that, that, that kept beating itself and couldn't get over the hump. You look at, at the Chicago game and the fire that Tom Brady had 
And it seemed like that was the game where you guys stopped beating yourselves. The penalties uh, kind of evaporated. The mistakes were, were, were dialed down. Um, what was it about that game? And, and I think that's why you wanted Tom here to help change the culture and bring that fire and intensity that he showed on the sidelines. What, what was it about that plane ride home from that game that seemed to propel this team um, forward and, and to have you guys stop beating yourselves? Yeah, that, that game was a um, – probably in my career here, we've had a lot of bad losses, but that one was one that really – stung the most I think and you know not only did we lose the way we lost with the penalties and things like that we also lost Vita and so I was talking about this the other day with Bruce actually I said gosh that game still that game still stings and he said that's the best thing that happened to us um, that game was the best thing that happened to us looking back in retrospect so I think he's right um we cleaned up our penalties. We were more disciplined, and it just brought everybody together. So it showed that we're all human. Um, everybody and everybody's accountable needs to be held accountable, and everybody on the roster, everybody in the front office, everybody in the organization. But um, it brought us closer together. Go to Ira Kaufman for all your years till this season uh, as the GM. You know, part of your job, you, you got to be the long range view. You know, the salary cap three years ahead of time, and the ages of the players, and Jason, talk about how that all changed on March 20th. Everything changed in terms of your philosophy, your perspective, and it was all in for this season. You know, I'm probably I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on that. Um, we were obviously all in for this season, but the way that we're set up right now, now there's a lot of uh, questions and a lot of unknowns right now yet in terms of what the salary cap is going to be. But I think we're set up beautifully, um, thanks to Mike Greenberg, uh, Jackie Davidson, um, making those decisions and, and giving me the, their input on how to set up contracts and things like that. So, yeah, we have a, a we, Tom is 43 years old, but, and we have some other, I've said this a few times, some other elder statesmen on our, on our roster, but we have a young, young team, um, young defense, young secondary, young receivers. We have fairly young offensive line. So it, I wouldn't say it changed on March 20th. Um, we're still looking long-term and we're still have to plan long-term the way we set things up. And because of the job that Mike has Greenberg and Jackie Davidson have done, um, we're in that position to do that. Go to Lorenzo Reyes. Speaking of Jackie Davidson, I wanted to ask you specifically about her, um, just what she's brought to the organization um, since you guys hired her uh, earlier this year. And if you could point specifically to maybe one or two moments or tasks that she helped you with in sort of in terms of just, you know, contracts or roster, anything that you can share, like that would be very helpful. Thanks. Yeah, she's, she's awesome. She's, I'm so excited when we had the chance to get her. I've known her for several years now because of her relationship with Mike Greenberg and Mike Greenberg had always spoken so highly of her and her intelligence said that she's the smartest person that he's ever worked with um, in back in New York when they were together. She, um, she's made an impact already in her first year. She's, um, as advertised, brilliant. She helped us with, you know, every contract that we do is unique. It may seem simple when you read it across the ticker or see it online, see it on Twitter, that, you know, the Bucks signed Antonio Brown to this or signed – Leonard Fournette to that. It, the, all those contracts have a, a lot of conversations, a lot of tweaks, a lot of negotiations, and she was a big part in both of those. So I could point to those two right there. I don't know if we would have gotten those done without, um, without the work of Jackie and Mike. So hiring her just it goes along with the entire philosophy. That, you know, Bruce loves diversity um, and the Glazers – um, uh, the, have a philosophical view of, of inclusiveness um, of all um, races, all genders um, with the organization. And it just so happened she, she was a, she's a woman, just so happens that she's African-American. But we hired her because of her, her resume and what she brings to this organization. She, hiring her made us a smarter organization immediately. We'll go to Mike Reese. Up here in New England, I'm curious, what have you observed from Gronk in terms of how he's embraced Florida, this experience with the Bucks, 
and maybe answering from the perspective of someone that saw him when he was just coming into the league firsthand. Man, there's not a – if you're having a bad day, I, I suggest any of you just go spend a little time with Gronk. He's, he's just lifts you up just by being him. He's funny. Just We have conversations every day, and I look forward to it. I tell my wife, can't wait to go talk to Gronk at practice today. He's, he's just – he's being himself. He's very authentic. He loves the game. And when it's time to be serious, he's very serious. Um, he is, we, you know, there's a lot of talk of what Tom has done for this locker room and it's all warranted, but what Gronk has done for this locker room is equally as, um, amazing. Um, just a great teammate and loves life. We'll go over to Joey Knight. Jason, do you have any kind of theory for this, this unprecedented run of success among Bay area franchises, whether it's something in the water or whatever, and, Considering the success of the Lightning and the Rays, did you guys kind of feel pressure to perpetuate that success? I, I don't want to say we felt pressure. We were happy for them. I I'm, 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 can't speak for everybody. I, I never really had a we never really had a meeting about that. But um, I think it's just I think it's unbelievable. I think it's great for the city of Tampa. I think it's something that you know, hundred years from now, they'll still talk about. Um, during the pandemic, all teams had success. Now we're not finished yet. Once again, so we want to win this thing. I, I don't know what the, I don't have a theory on why it happened in Tampa. I guess maybe you can chalk it up to the water. I don't know, but I'm just happy it happened. We'll go to Sarah Walsh. Hey, Jason, I'm curious um, in this time frame. obviously when you guys were talking to Tom and, and trying to get him to come to Tampa Bay, I would assume that there was some talk of, hey, we can win a Super Bowl. Um, we've got the pieces in place. And I'm wondering if you can share with us what of those conversations maybe happened and did you reflect at all, you know, in this moment leading now into the Super Bowl, like, oh my God, this is, this is actually come to fruition, what we sort of <laughs> said could happen? Well, naturally, I think you just, you envision it when every year in the off season, you want to make some moves that, that hopefully get your team into the, into the Super Bowl. And I think when you sign a guy like Tom, it, it makes it a little bit more realistic. And just talking to him the days after we, we signed him, just, you could just, just hear the, and feel the confidence that he had. Um, and you know, made it a little bit more real. Now you never take anything for granted. So, you know, we had some highs and lows of the season where things uh, at times looked a little grim. We needed to pull together, but we never lost our confidence. But um, looking back on some of the things that we talked about, it's uh, it does, you do kind of want to pinch yourself a little bit saying, wow, this, this really did happen. Um, so I can't think of one particular time or one particular conversation that we had, but, um, but there were a lot amongst all of us. We're going to go over to Eric Adelson. Hi, Jason. I'm, I'm doing a story on the virtual draft from last year. Uh, obviously, you guys were very successful with that. What, what did you like the most about the format, and what was the biggest challenge about the format? Well, what I liked the most was in the months leading up to the draft that we, you know, we were working from home, and I got a lot of more work done, and I think everybody else did too, um, without distractions that you have and things that come up during – during the day in the office, um, I was able to share the experience with my family, which was the most special part of the whole thing that I'll never forget. And they won't either. We still talk about it to this day. I still have little sticky notes I've kept in my, in the draft room that we set up in our house uh, of my seven year old that would write down names of players that I should draft. Um, just little moments like that and sharing it at the time when we, when we did draft Tristan, um, having everybody come in and get a big family hug. Uh, it was really cool. Um, now the, the part that you don't like is not being able to share that with your, your coworkers and your scouts who work so incredibly hard. And they are right now, as we speak, um, with boots on the ground, getting ready for next year's draft. And I can't speak, say enough good things about them. Um, I have a great staff. I talk about a lot about the guys in house and they, they deserve the, a lot of tons of credit, more credit than, than I receive, but the scouts on the road are the lifeblood of the organization. And they, uh, you know, I get a little emotional about it. That's how I, that's how I came up in the business and I know what they're going through. So not to, to not have them there with you, it was a little bit of a, a gut punch, but, but being with the family was awesome. 
We'll go over to John Romano. You guys have had a lot of success the last few years drafting defensive backs. Could you talk about the, the philosophy of what you're looking for specifically in those players? Is there a common thread that you were seeking? Yeah, we have had some success recently. We didn't have a lot of success before that. I think trial and error helped with that. But, you know, Todd and his group, his staff, of defensive coaches are, are excellent teachers. They, um, we had a clear vision of what they were looking for in Todd's scheme. And we liked bigger, longer guys that are physical and smart. And guys that if they're maybe short on, on size and length, they have to be extremely tough. And Todd finds a way to, you know, work these different talents and skill sets into his defense and change his defense to, um, to better utilize what they are. But, you know, it's a, it's a really, really good group that we have right now. And, you know, there was a lot of trial and error that went into that. And uh, I'm just happy that these guys are, it's working out and Todd and his staff, uh, they deserve a lot of credit, uh, if not all the credit for the way that these guys have been playing here during the playoff run. Our last one's going to come from Ben Volan. I was looking over your resume, and I believe in 1999 and 2000, you were a college scout for the Patriots. Uh, just curious if you had any interactions on the scouting trail with Tom Brady, if you remember what the discussions were like about him leading up to the draft, what you remember about him, you know, when he just got to the Patriots, uh, things of that nature. Yeah, so I worked up in – got my first job with the Patriots um, in 1999. It was my first full-time scouting job um, for, a, for a club. And we went eight and eight that year. Pete Carroll was the coach. He was let go. And then uh, Bill Belichick was hired and went right into draft meetings the minute he walked into the building. And um, so I got to know him through those meetings. A um, little intimidating, uh, but he ended up giving me a promotion after that. Um, I did not personally um, evaluate scout um, Tom. I was a Southeast area scout at the time. Um, I was involved in the, I was, uh, you know, listened to the conversations about him and we watched tape together, but I, I can't take any credit for Tom uh, being drafted. I do know that coach Belichick um, really had his eye on him for a long time and it wasn't, you know, we took him in the six. We didn't need a quarterback at the time. We had him, he had him much higher than that. He and Scott Pioli had him much higher than that on the board. Um, the conversation started with, I, I, if I recall correctly, the third round, but, um, and he was still, still sitting there in the sixth and they took him. I wish I could take credit for it, but uh, I got to know Tom a little bit in my years there. Never really kept in touch other than if we happened to play each other and maybe wave to him on the sideline or something. But um, so when we signed him here and, and talked on the phone, it was really the first time I've talked to him since, uh, uh, 2011 when I was with the Patriots.